Welcome to the Web Platform Podcast, a developer discussion that dives deep into all things web. We discuss topics relevant to developing for the modern web and the web platform of today, tomorrow, and beyond. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Web Platform Podcast, episode number 162. Today we're talking about WebAssembly. We are your hosts this week, Justin Ribeiro, Danny Blue, and Leon Revel. Leon, Danny, hello. Good to see you. Hi. Hello, Justin, and welcome back, Leon. Thank you. Good yes. to be back. I, yes. A, a married individual now. Is that correct, Leon? <laughs> That's true, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. I know <laughs> listeners will be sending gifts from all over the world, which... <laughs> Wow, <laughs> which I will, I, I will presume will be in the form of tweets and gifts because I think that's what wedding gifts are now—is just gifts. Yeah, tweets are um, easier to ship. <laughs> yes, significantly less expensive, unless of course bandwidth you're paying for. Oh, gifts and your inability to be compressed properly. But we're not talking about gifts today. We're talking about WebAssembly. But before we even get to WebAssembly, I'm going to throw it over to Leon, who's going to talk about this week in the web in two minutes or less. Leon. Thanks, Justin. Um, so the, the first big announcement I think most people would have heard about already is the fact that Microsoft is acquiring GitHub. Um, so that's going to be interesting to see that unfold over the, the coming months. Um, TypeScript 2.9 has just been released, and that includes some new features such as import types, uh, dash dash pretty by default, type arguments for tag template strings, and much more. Um, Chrome 67 is now also available on Android, which is good to see. There's a host of new features in Safari 12, which is going to ship in iOS 12 and macOS 10.14. Um, and that includes improvements to the web inspector and tools. So check out the link for full details. Um, a new minor version uh, for Webpack has just been released, um, and that's version 4.11. And that includes some new features and bug fixes. So go and check that out. Um, and Google has just published an intent to implement for WebGPU, which is a successor to WebGL with lower overhead access to GP. GPU hardware and better, more predictable performance. That's going to be good to see that moving along as well. And that's everything from me for this week in web. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Leon. The web GPU thing makes me generally somewhat happy, um, particularly after the announcement of Metal yesterday from Apple, which seems rather closed off to the notion of, you know, I don't know, OpenGL uh, kind of and things. Off. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Not not super thrilled with that. Uh, but yeah, it'll be good to see uh, WebGPU uh, make its appearance onto the platform. And speaking of low-level things that do awesome things, hey, we're talking about WebAssembly today. It's been a long time since we talked about WebAssembly. How long has it been, Danny? Seven, eight years? <laughs> Feels like it at this point, but it has, it has been several years since we've talked about it on the show. And to help us talk about this, today we're going to welcome Thomas and Ben. Thomas, Ben, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thanks. for. Uh, it's great to be here. So for those who don't know you, uh, why don't you guys introduce yourself and tell everyone a little bit about what you all do? Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Thomas Nastad. I'm the product manager on the web platform for a number of things, including WebAssembly. Yeah, and I'm Ben Smith. I work at Google as a software engineer on the WebAssembly team. Um, I'm also the co-chair of the WebAssembly community group, uh, W3C com community group. So um yeah, I primarily work on spec stuff for WebAssembly and and such. So, so I can only imagine the arguments there are just magical. I <laughs> or I'm sorry, not arguments. Arguments is probably the discussions. wrong word. Discussions, <laughs> lively debates. <laughs> Danny, you were saying something before I rudely cut you off. I apologize. No, it's fine. I was just going to say that, uh, that these two people seem like they should know what they're talking about when it comes to WebAssembly. So hopefully we all get to learn a bunch of stuff because I do not know very much. See, see, you would think that, but I, I think <laughs> we might just surprise you. We'll do our best. <laughs> uh, it'd be really good if um, somebody could just provide like a really basic level overview about what WebAssembly is and um, just for those who maybe have never even heard of it. Yeah, I can I can try and take a crack at this one, and and throughout the the talk, you know, you might hear me say things, and then Ben can always jump in with any like, yeah, but that's not technically exactly right. So I'll I'll do my best as a basic explanation of WebAssembly. Uh, WebAssembly is a new low level format for the web. Uh, it's an assembly like level, which is to say that it's very close to the code that your actual CPU understands, uh, which means that it has some really great performance characteristics. Uh, and very importantly, is a format that you would not actually write yourself. Uh, instead, you would take languages like C++ and then compile them 
to WebAssembly the same way that you might compile them to assembly on your machine and, and then actually ship that WebAssembly code uh, down the wire to your client. And then that WebAssembly code is understood by the uh, browser and executed uh, within the sandbox browser environment. Uh, WebAssembly is supported on all four major browsers as of last year, which is great, which means that finally you have an actual new runtime uh, and a new option for executing code on the web uh, as opposed to just JavaScript. Ben, did I miss anything? I think you got it all pretty well. So I actually want to go back to that point uh, one more time of what you said, that it is another runtime environment. So is WebAssembly a replacement for JavaScript, or is it just another option? And how come this runtime environment has gotten the backing of major browser vendors where others didn't? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting story. Uh, and just to really very loudly and clearly state up front, WebAssembly is not a replacement to JavaScript. The two were very much meant and designed to interoperate. Uh, today, uh, and probably in the future as well, you will instantiate your WebAssembly fr um, from JavaScript, and a lot of the communications will still happen through JavaScript. JavaScript remains a fantastic language for many, many applications, and in a lot of use cases, JavaScript is the exact right choice for developers. There's also obviously an amazing ecosystem of JavaScript things, so I, I, we don't see JavaScript going away anytime soon. Or, and there are no... There are no future plans to, to make Java, to make JavaScript go away at all. Um, it, and it's certainly not the goal of uh, yeah, of WebAssembly. Yeah, I mean, we are, the the purpose of WebAssembly is to, in a lot of ways to take pressure off of JavaScript. Uh, so, like JavaScript was sort of doing double duty for a long time as a compilation target and as a programming language for people to write. And so, a lot of what WebAssembly does is it says, if you want to have a compilation target, here's an alternate. VM that you can use instead. Yeah, I, I think that's a great articulation. Uh, and to get into the second part of your question of kind of what's the history and why has WebAssembly been the thing to finally get support, uh, that the history there is quite interesting. And some of the listeners will know things about uh, Asm.js, which was a precursor that came out of uh, Mozilla and Firefox. And that was exactly as Ben described, basically this idea of let's take a language like C++ and compile it to JavaScript. Like what, what exactly would that look like? Uh, and it would look like, as it turns out, Asm.js, which was uh, a really interesting project and has laid the foundation for a lot of what WebAssembly has ended up becoming. Uh, but as Ben said, JavaScript, you know, it, it ended up being a compilation target for something like C++, but it really wasn't designed for that. Um, Asm was one interesting variant of this kind of like idea of a new execution environment for the web that came out of Mozilla. And then you also had things like Knackle and Pnackle that came out of the Chrome org. And both of these were interesting and innovative ways to you know, try and make up for uh, some of the shortcomings of JavaScript uh, as a compilation target. Uh, but ultimately, you know, they weren't supported on all four of the different browsers uh, and there wasn't complete adoption. And so after kind of iterating on some of these uh, in each of our respective companies, uh, we really just decided to come together and make this WebAssembly thing as the fully standardized and fully designed uh, and co-spec uh, aspect. And Ben might have some of the more uh, detailed background there as well. Yeah. So, I mean, there's actually a long history of this, right? Like when the web sort of first came into existence, there was, I guess, no programming language. And then, of course, there's the the mythical, what was it, 10 days that, that JavaScript was created? Is that the number? Does anyone know? Yeah, fam famously, famously 10 days. Famously 10 days. So JavaScript became sort of the, the language of the web, right? But languages of, and, and VMs have been trying to come into the web platform uh, since then, right? So Flash is sort of a famous example, or even like VBScript, right? Um, uh, or even Java. Um, and each one of those languages and VMs had their own issues, right? Like primarily the issue with most of them is that they didn't actually work with the, the web platform in the, in the way that you want it to, right? Like there's always this question about how do you access the DOM? Do you access the DOM? Do you, do you actually interact with, with JavaScript in a normal way or do you actually um, have to like pass messages back and forth um, and so a lot of those VMs, including native client, um, had those sorts of issues where it almost felt like something that you bolted onto the side of the web platform instead of actually integrating directly into it. 
Um, and so one of the things that we were very, very cognizant of when we were developing WebAssembly is how do you design a new VM that provides a lot of functionality, but feels like it's a part of the web platform. And so one of the major things that we've done with WebAssembly is we made it so that you can call back and forth between JavaScript and WebAssembly seamlessly. They share a stack um, and they share an environment. And in a lot of cases, they actually share a lot of the same uh, uh, code generation. So um, I think that's one of the things that makes WebAssembly very, very different and, and, and sort of better than a lot of those sort of, <laughs> you know, other VMs that we won't talk about anymore because they're not important. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's that's exactly right. And just to even pile on to that, uh, one of the other issues that you saw with a lot of these previous VMs, such as Flash um, and Java applets, were just the security issues that they introduced uh, by nature of not being part of the platform. And this is another big point that WebAssembly really stresses is uh, the complete security of it as an execution and sandbox environment. So um, back on to Danny's first question about, you know, is WebAssembly a replacement for JavaScript? And you've outright said that it isn't. But um, maybe this is maybe a simplistic question, but if WebAssembly is, is more capable, more powerful, um, and, and uh, available in all of the major browsers, why isn't it a replacement for JavaScript? Kind of what's the pros and cons? Where where does WebAssembly fit in? Um, not as well as where, you, where JavaScript would do, if you could answer that. Yeah, I, I can I can try and give a brief articulation of that. Uh, one of the aspects of WebAssembly is that you do uh, today have to call it from JavaScript to instantiate it, and also to interface with the DOM directly, you do actually go through JavaScript to do that. And so right now, if you're doing the very classical Java, JavaScript development of web pages, uh, you're using it to interact with the DOM, you're using it to do various uh, event handlers and such, and talk to web APIs, JavaScript is still a great language for that. And you're not going to gain significant benefits uh, uh, from WebAssembly uh, unless you have a very specialized uh, setup with how you, know, how you compile from C++ and the fact that you want to write in C++. Uh, JavaScript is still the, the right option for all of those use cases. The spaces where WebAssembly really shines is, number one, if you don't want to write JavaScript, which is to say that you want to write C++ really bad. WebAssembly now allows you to do that. Uh, and it also is great uh, for really performance demanding workloads, specifically uh, tons of number crunching if you want to do things like codecs or video editing uh, or anything that's really performance demanding, basically things that you previously couldn't do on the web because the performance just wasn't there. That's Those are the kind of use cases that WebAssembly really enables. Ben, anything yeah, to add? Um... I would say that that's that's definitely right. Um, it's not just C++, though. Uh, certainly, Rust is one of the the big languages that's that's betting pretty pretty heavily on WebAssembly. Um, but we all we're also seeing a lot of languages that um, are showing interest. So um, Microsoft has been pushing on uh, C Sharp, and um, I believe there are some Java uh, VMs as well that have been ported to WebAssembly. So um, I think we will start to see other languages there too. But but Thomas is right in that a big difference between WebAssembly and JavaScript is just um, the intended use case, right? JavaScript is meant to be written by hand, and it's very convenient for that. Um, and it's very easy to write a lot of very simple stuff. You know, if you just need a little bit of code, like why would you go through the trouble of using WebAssembly? It, it's just an additional uh, layer between you and your execution. Um, a big win that you get for WebAssembly is when you have a big pile of data and you want to just crunch through it all, right? Um, I think what we found is that there are a lot of uh, tools that people have wanted to bring to the web and they haven't been able to just get the performance there to be able to do so. And so WebAssembly is, is helpful for enabling things like that. I think that's one of the big differences. But if you just want to be able to you know, get your uh, UI loaded, like a lot of times that's just not performance sensitive. And so JavaScript is a great language for that. There does seem to be some misconception, I think, around the notion that because you're you're programming in C++ or Rust and you're compiling down into WebAssembly, you get this notion that, oh, it will be faster than JavaScript now. And I think this I think this misconception comes from the fact that people don't realize how t well tuned JavaScript is in terms of things like V8 and 
uh, the amount of work that goes in because you can write very performant JavaScript code. That doesn't necessarily mean that, again, to your point, uh, it's about the use case, right? Like you don't have to go back and go, I need to get rid of all my JavaScript and rewrite it. Uh, to target WebAssembly as my output target. Um, you can keep your JavaScript and then do those heavy use case things. You don't have to feel the need to write your uh, your for loops purely in C++ to try if, to get more performance If you performance like your out. JavaScript, There's... you can keep it, right? Isn't that exactly. It? Yeah, and I, I think you make a great point about V8 and JavaScript being really you know finely tuned. Uh, fun fact, the V8 team and the WebAssembly team are actually the same team. Uh, on Chrome, and so it's it's literally the same people implementing this stuff and providing you these two different options. See, people talk. I think <laughs> people fail to understand at some at some point uh, there is cross communication amongst these things. Um, one is not meant to replace the other. Things can be used together in interesting ways to create more interesting user experiences. Danny, you had a question. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, uh, but yes, I do have a question. Well, first part statement, second part question. Uh, we have talked a lot about JavaScript and I think we've done a good job kind of clarifying that they are not, that, uh, uh, um, WebAssembly is not a replacement for JavaScript, but with that, let's talk about what WebAssembly is good for. Let's talk about the things that WebAssembly does well. Um, it's like even forgetting about the tooling or, or, or that kind of thing. It, it's like, so okay, so it's not a replacement for replacement for JavaScript. What do we use it for? Yeah, it's a great question, and and this is where I'll jump in. Um, I think of WebAssembly as having a ton of different possibilities and a ton of different use cases, and so it's kind of useful to bucket them a little bit. And the three uh, buckets that I usually think about is the performance advantages of WebAssembly, the portability advantages of WebAssembly. And the flexibility slash ergonomics of WebAssembly and what that uh, means for developers. And so to very briefly kind of break those uh, three down and describe them a little bit, uh, WebAssembly does give a higher performance uh, for some workloads, specifically computationally intensive ones. And it's interesting to see the ways that people have already started to use this. One of the uh, examples is for some libraries that are trying to do lots of computation things and are sometimes performance bound, swapping out for WebAssembly can offer some advantages. And we've seen the uh, Glimmer rendering engine, which is the thing that sits inside of Ember, has started to make some commits with WebAssembly to investigate some of the performance aspects. And this is again where there's a library that's so extremely popular that getting even a couple of percent uh, improvement means a lot for all of the different users that they have. And so you can gain those performance aspects by integrating into existing libraries. You can also create entirely new libraries. And I think this is where you see uh, interesting examples like facial recognitions, codecs, physics engines, uh, all these kinds of different libraries that you know you couldn't do really effectively before in the browser. And now they're actually enabled by uh, WebAssembly. There's another uh, interesting example here of a barcode scanner where for a while, uh, people have wanted kind of the ability to scan barcodes on their phone on the web. It's a useful capability. And there was a standards process that was kind of going at it and, and trying to get that actually implemented uh, in, in the browser itself. And then somebody was able to, with WebAssembly, actually just find a C++ library to do this and port it over with WebAssembly uh, and have it be performant enough that it could effectively read uh, barcodes uh, at a high rate. And so this is kind of a new capability that didn't actually have to be baked into the browser but rather could be enabled in user land just from the performance advantages that we saw with WebAssembly. Um, to dive into the, the second aspect of porting, uh, the porting advantages that WebAssembly provides can be really meaningful. And here we can break it down further by talking about porting applications. And here we've seen a lot of really interesting use cases such as uh, Autodesk. They were able to port uh, AutoCAD, which was a 35-year-old code base that they were able to port to the web um, and have run in the browser. And so you have this idea that with WebAssembly, you can take these old applications that used to exist in the native world on your operating system, actually bring them to your web, and then gain all of those advantages. Uh, but we can also talk about porting existing open source libraries. And so there are tons of amazing C++ open source uh, libraries and applications. Uh, and you can now start to just wholesale take large chunks of those and then utilize them on the web through WebAssembly without having to rewrite all of them in JavaScript. 
Uh, and just to kind of close out on the flexibility point, this is where I think things like Rust come up and, and other languages and this idea that with WebAssembly, you don't just have that JavaScript choice. You have some more flexibility in how you architecture out your application, in what language you use, um, and really giving that to developers through WebAssembly. So those are, those are some of the use cases that I, I usually think of and some of the advantages that WebAssembly brings. The notion that you can port things in, I think, is from a library perspective, is one of the more fanciful things that I quite like about it. Uh, the barcode thing in particular, because I legitimately had to do that for something else, <laughs> uh, which I feel like is like the quintessentially the, 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 the really nice part about this, because for a long time, from a web perspective, we've had to wait for lower level APIs that allow us to do more with the platform. Um, which is to some extent by design, right? We don't want to implement um, low-level APIs that are uh, not good for the platform, right? They're good. There's a lot of thought that goes into that from a standards relation process, and obviously the browser vendors across the board have a lot of input into that. WebAssembly sort of opens up a floodgate of things where that probably wasn't going to be a standard uh, because no one really wanted necessarily to, you know, why should the web do that per se? Uh, but now... Uh, we've got libraries <laughs> we can do things they, they, and with things like web usb and web bluetooth all of a sudden there's a lot of open doors yeah you're exactly right um and i think you make an interesting point about these low level apis and being on the web platform and seeing kind of how the sausage is made if you will i think there's a interesting comparison where in the past we had to be more high level opinionated about our apis because you had to interface them with javascript and so you couldn't actually uh, get these extremely low-level ones because you just, just didn't have an interfacing mechanism that worked effectively for that. And now with WebAssembly, we can actually go back to the web platform and design some of these lower-level APIs that can then be communicated to at very high rates uh, through WebAssembly. And, and we're seeing some of that work start in the web GPU team and some of the web audio stuff that we're also working and on. And just as another example, actually, um, things like WebSQL... Uh, which basically exist in all browsers now and, and are reasonably compatible. There, I, my understanding is that it actually took some time for that to be the case, for, for you to be able to sort of have compatibility across browsers with, with that API. And if you had something like SQLite compiled to WebAssembly, then you don't actually have to worry about compatibility in the same way, right? Because you know you're actually executing the same code. Uh, on each browser. So there's definitely a benefit there, not in t not just in terms of like functionality in the browser, but also being able to be more certain that the code that you're executing is the same ac um, across all browsers. So we talked quite a bit about, um, you know, porting applications or even libraries and stuff into WebAssembly, but what, what are the limitations there? Like surely you couldn't just take absolutely anything in it and, and get it to run in the browser. Um, yeah, what are the limitations? Are there any ceilings or walls that the, the stuff you just can't do, or, or is is it really that flexible? Uh, I think some of the primary limitations that you'll run into is when you've used uh, operating specific aspects, and so that is to say that if you have some piece of C plus plus logic, you should be able to take that and then just port it directly over. But in places where you take advantage of operating system APIs, such as if you use if you've created a Windows application and that utilizes a lot of Windows APIs to do like your window managing, you will have to reconstruct those in a more web or in a more web friendly way. Uh, and this is a perfect example of what we saw AutoCAD do, where they were able to take their whole rendering engine, basically you know 99% of their code base, and port it wholesale over with WebAssembly. And then the only thing that they had to recreate on the web was kind of the UI surrounding it uh, and the interface points. Uh, but those are, I, when I think about porting things, are, is the primary thing that people will run into. Yeah. Is, is operating system specifics. When, when uh, people port code, it's, it's, it's often very much uh, the same. Uh, porting to the web and porting to something like uh, a different operating system. And th I think that's kind of the way that people will think of it, is that like if you have a cross-platform piece of code, you know, it already runs on Windows and Mac OS and Linux, then... Uh, porting to the web, what we want it to be is just like it's another operating system. And I think we're we're hopefully going to get to that place. And so the, the goal would be to have like a platform abstraction layer such that uh, you can sort of swap out the pieces underneath, but keep a lot of the sort of core application logic or the core library logic the same. 
Um, so yeah, I think it would be the operating system stuff would be the stuff that you would have to uh, be most wary of. I really like that that analogy that makes a lot more sense now. Um, and what what's the kind of, I mean, I'm sure we'll get into the security side of things, but what's stopping somebody writing, you know, compiling some code down to WebAssembly and, you know, stealing all my files off my computer? Like what's, what's the story there? Well, the great news about WebAssembly is that it works the exact same as the web that you're used to, which is to say that all of the sandboxing and all of the protection are still in place. If you want things like more access, if you want, you know, video feed or microphone access, you still have to get those in the exact same way. All of that uh, access is still completely mediated by the browser. Uh, and as you say, we could get into a lot more of the security specifics of the WebAssembly format itself, um, but it is secure and doesn't give any uh, additional access to anything on your system. It can't go around snooping. It can't go around deleting all of your files. All of that is still intermediated by the browser. In a lot of ways, actually, yeah, WebAssembly has um, a very good story for for modularization. So, yeah, Thomas kind of touched on it a little bit, but basically, the idea is that you have a module and it can import a set of functionality and it can export a set of functionality, and it can't do anything that it doesn't import. And so, um, that's one thing that actually a lot of people um, who are using WebAssembly outside of the web are very interested in because it provides this. It, it's not exactly a sandbox, but in a sense, you can sort of think of it as its own sort of API surface for each module. Um, so you can't just grab files because WebAssembly module can't do anything that you don't give it permission to do. Yeah, and I think we've actually seen some pretty interesting use cases of WebAssembly outside of the web. Uh, two of the top ones have been blockchains, surprise. Uh, where they've actually uh, started to use WebAssembly because of some of those security aspects that Ben just described, uh, as well as CDNs have started uh, utilizing them, utilizing WebAssembly uh, as a way to run untrusted user code on your machine. It's just a really great format for doing exactly that. So you can run the WebAssembly uh, runtime not in the browser. The the so is I mean is WebAssembly almost a misnomer then for uh, for this fact because it's because it sounds like because we're talking about it in in terms of in terms of the browsers but it sounds like the browsers are just implementing this one runtime which you could theoretically do everywhere. There is there is this general joke that you'll sometimes see on Twitter which is that WebAssembly is neither of the web nor assembly and and I would like to completely dissuade uh, that joke. I, I think that's completely untrue. From kind of day one, we have been designing WebAssemblies to work specifically in the browser. At the same time, though, it has been a goal of the team to make sure that WebAssembly can still run outside of the browser. And it's specifically to support some of these general um, interesting use cases that we do that. But fundamentally, we uh, created WebAssembly primarily for the browser, and we continue to improve the interoperability of WebAssembly uh, with the browser. But yes, it does run outside of the browser as well. Uh, and that does enable a lot of these interesting use cases. Uh, and we could also get into more of the assembly aspect of that joke, but uh, that might not be the most interesting thing to spend the next 15 minutes on. Um, so if, if so, honestly, I would love to get into that if we, <laughs> uh, if we do end up having time. Um, but so I have, uh, I have one question that comes up. So if not that comes up that, that I'm thinking about. So is Web so... Would WebAssembly code be available in web and service workers? Uh, yeah, definitely. Okay. All right, cool. So, th so, fact, so actually, what I'm thinking. Oh, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, in fact, actually, um, there's a recent uh, feature called uh, Audio Worklets that's, um, that's yes. been, uh, starting to, I think that's actually implemented in one of the more recent uh, Chrome. Uh, versions. And um, that's a definite use case as well, is being able to load WebAssembly into the audio worklet and be able to, to do audio processing um, off the main thread so that you don't have to worry about uh, uh, janking your UI while you do that. So yeah, pretty cool stuff. And yeah, definitely service workers as well. Let's hope Zencast yeah, so that's very cool. soon. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and because what because what I'm thinking is that because you're talking about taking some of these uh, you know pre-existing C++ libraries or whatever and compiling that, them down to WebAssembly, well, it's like well, it's like well, you know, like some of those libraries I guess could potentially be pretty large. But if you could theoretically take a large C++ library, compile it down to WebAssembly, and then run it in a separate thread, 
that all just kind of sounds yeah, amazing. Totally. <laughs> We're making and it happen. There are some examples of this too currently. Uh, a good example of this is Kenneth's uh, WebP decoder, which compiled in Wasm runs in a service worker and basically brings WebP decoding to images for browsers that don't support WebP. So I think that was the most, I don't know, one of the more interesting cases uh, that you again you can you can offload right when in doubt offload threads or workers rather. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's that's something that you can do today <laughs> actually um, using just post message like uh, using a, a worker and then a post message to that thread and then having that thread just process the data and send it back. Um, but you know, I don't know if we want to get into it just yet. But but uh, actually, there's a proposal to add uh, threading primitive to WebAssembly as well, and that way you won't actually have to use post message. You'll be able to communicate uh, through shared memory with your worker to get even faster uh, communication and provide even better um, uh, functionality to the WebAssembly platform. This might be quite a difficult question to answer, um, but. Could you try and describe um, roughly how... So you, you mentioned earlier, basically, that um, you interface with WebAssembly with, with a JavaScript as an API like you maybe would do other web APIs. Could you describe maybe, as best you can without, obviously, visuals, how how you would set up um, uh, utilizing some WebAssembly code and then actually interfacing with it, if, if that makes sense? Uh, yeah, I can talk a little about, the, about this. Uh, so basically... Um, what you start with is a WebAssembly module. And the module is just a, a binary file. It's a collection of bytes. Um, and the browser knows how to interpret this. So you, you call a JavaScript function, which is WebAssembly.instantiate, and you pass it in this module, or you pass it in a URL where to get the module. And then what you also pass is a collection of uh, basically a JavaScript object, which is the set of imports that you're passing to this module. And then what happens is that the browser takes those two things and it starts to try and compile the WebAssembly and it looks at the imports and it tries to wire them up uh, and make sure that everything sort of uh, matches up properly. And once you've done that, you get back what we call a WebAssembly instance. And then the instance provides a collection of functions that you can call. And when you call those functions, they look like just normal JavaScript functions. As far as you're concerned, there's no difference. But what's happening is that it's actually calling into WebAssembly, and it'll give you back some result. Um, that's basically all there is to it. Uh, the, the more tricky part is basically getting the data that you want in and out of the system. And so currently, that requires some JavaScript glue uh, to, for, for most things. Um, but if future features will make that uh, more, um, more simple, like be able to actually interface with real JavaScript objects. So are those methods that are available on that instance, are they methods that the, the you can define as the you know the WebAssembly code that you end up compiling, or is that just a preset of methods available, like you would c communicate with a worker, for example? Uh, you don't find them yourself. Those are defined actually inside the WebAssembly module. So when you when you uh, create your WebAssembly module, like I said, you have these these imports. Um, think of them almost the same as a JavaScript import. It's saying get me something. I don't know exactly what it is, but get me a function. And then when you export, it's very much like a JavaScript module export. And it'll just say, here's what, here's what I'm giving back to the world. <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, and so in a lot of ways, this very, very much uh, lines up with uh, ECMAScript modules, the JavaScript module system. And, and that's actually by design as well. And just to kind of add a little bit more description there, when you as the WebAssembly author are creating your for example, C++ or Rust code, that's at the point where you would be able to define those functions. And so as the author of the general module, you do get to define um, how you interface with the WebAssembly module, and you have full flexibility in how you do that. And one of the most exciting aspects of that to me is that that means that a library author can go write some C++ code, create some module, um, and then actually create a JavaScript API for interfacing with that module and ship it on NPM or anything else to share it with other developers who might not even know that it's actually WebAssembly. And they will be interfacing with this library as though it's just a JavaScript library, but secretly it'll be WebAssembly under the hood. And so I'm really excited to see uh, all of the different libraries that will be created with WebAssembly and unlock a bunch of these like new powers that WebAssembly enables 
but give access to those powers to all web developers, even those who have no idea that WebAssembly exists. That is very, very cool. I agree. Me too. <laughs> so as WebAssembly has sort of gone down, you've talked about sort of the things that are coming into the future of things, threads particularly, which, you know, I find that particularly exciting, though I'm not sure... I'm not sure how exciting that is to the general developer community, given that threads can be difficult to work with um, if you've never worked with threads. Um, what else do you look at in terms of the future of Web, WebAssembly is? I mean, it's, it is quite a story that we have four browsers, you know, the major browsers implement WebAssembly, which is a massive victory in and of itself, given the way that standards sometimes go. I mean, what kind of future sort of features can we look forward to in terms of what WebAssembly might bring? Uh, yeah, so I can talk about this a little bit. Um, so yeah, Threads is probably one of the biggest ones. Uh, and I think when we talk about Threads, I think a lot of times people think about, you know, I mean, I suppose most of us here are developers, right? And so when we think Threads, we think, oh my God, I don't want to have to deal with that. Um, but a lot of the reason why we do deal with it is because it, it provides us with a, a lot of opportunity to, to make just more interesting and, and better applications. Like, so um, in particular, games are very, very excited about having uh, features like threads um, or even things like, uh, you know, uh, decompressors. Um, it's often very, very useful to have another thread running in the background so that you don't have to, again, like sort of jank the main thread. So, so that's one uh, feature that I think is very, very uh, important and, and we're excited to see uh, come into the WebAssembly uh, fold. Um, some other ones uh, that we'll see maybe soon are things like SIMD. So that's uh, um, a single instruction with multiple data. Um, it's kind of a low level concept, but basically it's the same sort of idea as threads it's it's allowing us to do uh often for processing like media for like processing audio or processing video uh, for codecs and things like that they always want things like simd because it just means that they can chew through more data often you have big big blocks of data and you just want to like get through as much as it of it as possible and so simd will help there uh one that a lot of people are very excited about is um gc so when we talk about GC, what we're really talking about is interfacing with the JavaScript uh, garbage collector. And so what that means is that um, currently WebAssembly only works with sort of raw numbers, 32-bit um, and 64-bit instant floats. And you can do a lot with that. And, and we've sort of proven that by what people already have done with WebAssembly. But there are still limitations. So like WebAssembly right now, it's, it's quite difficult to work with the DOM because the DOM is all implemented as JavaScript objects. And so part of what we're trying to do with, uh, with the GC proposal is get to a place where we can actually uh, import uh, DOM objects, manipulate them in WebAssembly, and not have to uh, communicate back out to JavaScript um, to, to do that work. And what that'll provide is the ability to, um, for one, just be able to access it more quickly, not have to interface through JavaScript, but then also just provide a lot more functionality to languages like C Sharp or Java that want to be able to interface with the DOM and don't want to have to have sort of JavaScript dunks to do that. So um, that's another really, really big one that I think um, as we move forward on, on that proposal, people will, you will start to see a lot more languages jump in and a lot more people who will be excited about it as well. Um, so those are probably the big three. Um, Thomas, can you think of uh, any others? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, potentially useful to break apart that third one a little bit, which is to say that uh, we want to enable more languages by offering kind of what we call a, like a managed runtime, which is to say that lar languages such as Java that reply, rely on having a garbage collection system, we want to better support those uh, languages on the web platform fundamentally. Uh, but there are also some advantages that come before we get to that point, which is the ability for WebAssembly to interface more directly with some of the web APIs. So one example is WebGL. And right now, if you want to have a WebAssembly application that makes WebGL calls, to make a, a, an individual WebGL call, it actually goes through a JavaScript layer. Uh, and then the JavaScript calls the WebGL API. And we're actually enabling it such that WebAssembly can make those calls directly. And that'll increase the number of things that you can really meaningfully use WebAssembly for that do have a lot of these interactions with the DOM or web APIs. 
Yeah, it's actually really funny. Every time I meet up with the Chrome GPU team, they're always like, so when's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? They're just really, really excited for this feature. So especially as this runtime improves and matures, is it going to make sense for browser vendors to implement their own features actually using uh, actually using WebAssembly? So rather than writing, um, rather than just, it, it kind of goes back to the same thing of, so back in the jQuery days, everyone's like, well, you should just bake jQuery into the browser. You're like, it's, it's that easy, all, all that kind of stuff. Does this actually give the browser vendors um, ability to, we're, we're talking about the um, uh, things like the barcode scanner, if that type of thing was going to be uh, a spec or something like that, would it actually make sense to implement these features in WebAssembly versus the native browser code. I think you are going to see some examples of that happening. And I think we've already been in some conversations where, you know, in the old days, we might have done this as definitely a browser thing, but now we are able to do it actually just in user land. And I don't know if we're going to see the browser actually shipping WebAssembly code in place of C++ code uh, that it would otherwise ship. But I do think we're going to see a general transition to enabling more of these capabilities in user land rather than having to pick them in the browser. And what I mean by user land is to say that any user can create a library for this, this kind of thing that they want to accomplish. I'll add a little bit to that. I, I know that at least on um, Chrome, especially with native client, we t had a lot of talks with with various groups who were interested in providing functionality using an alternate runtime. One of the things that um, you'll find with working with uh, Chrome and uh, just browser engineers in general is that we're very security conscious. And one of the issues with writing a lot of uh, browser code is that it's just it's easy to make mistakes and it's easy to have something that'll have a sandbox ex exploit. So for example, like if you have an image decoder, like I think it was recently found that there were exploits in, um, well, I can't remember which one it was, but certainly there have been uh, exploits found in almost all image decoders and video decoders and so on. And so people who are security conscious want to have the ability to just have an extra layer of security there. And if you have enough performance, then what's the drawback, right? So having something implemented in WebAssembly, I think is is definitely, I think we're going to see uh, people start to do that, um, not just for uh, the reasons that it'll be convenient to do so, but also because it'll provide an additional layer of security there. I think it's interesting that from a maybe not a browser feature standpoint, but a browser polyfill standpoint, or a probably fill standpoint, uh, WebAssembly gives us quite a bit more footprint there too, where we can go ahead and say, hey, uh, I wonder if this is a good idea for the web. Um, before we get into that notion of, oh, maybe it should be a standard or, or one of those sort of approaches. Whereas in before with, uh, you know, a good example of this is probably the old Shadow DOM spec, right? That was an engineering marvel right, that they wrote that in JavaScript, that it somehow ran. Um, but the problem was, was that it wasn't very fast. Um, with the WebAssembly side of life, you ideally get the ability to, you know, test run the things that we necessarily want to see on the web, uh, you know, which may be the next, oh, geez, I don't know, query selector all or one of those the sorts of things um, before we get to the stage where, oh, maybe we should all have a conversation about spec, which I think is very interesting because um, we haven't really had Beyond JavaScript, we haven't really had that ability yet of other runtimes to be able to do that sort of thing. I think that's a really great observation, and I completely agree. I think at some fundamental, WebAssembly will hopefully change not just the the way that you can do the, not change not just what you can do on the web, but will also change this iteration process. And exactly as you described, we'll be able to actually test more things and kind of play around with these things through WebAssembly. Um, and then only if it's necessary or if you gain some additional advantage from doing it actually as part of the browser, can we then standardize it. And then by that point, we'll also have much more of an idea of how we want the API surface to look like. Um, and I think that's going to be a huge advantage that WebAssembly will enable for the general future development of the web platform. Yeah, and just as a bit of a technical detail as well. Um, like I said before, with the fact that WebAssembly modules have an import and export, um, it means that it's actually easier to sort of isolate those polyfills 
Uh, so one of the things with JavaScript, right, is that, you know, if you modify a prototype, you're modifying the prototype for everybody in the, in, in the same sort of JavaScript context, right? Uh, with WebAssembly, you don't have to worry about that as much. Uh, you really can ca- create separate modules that do their own thing, and they don't really touch anybody else's stuff, right? They're, they're very hands-off in that regard. <laughs> Yeah, and I think there's a I think there's a lot of value in in that where they they are indeed very hands off where you don't end up with developer confusion uh, because I think that with any new runtime that you add into the platform right it it does create this like we've seen right oh no JavaScript's going to go away no it's not um, oh no I have to learn this thing that looks very hard and I was told once that this book was the book to get and oh no I I don't know how to read this book. No, you don't. Like, there's a lot of things that, you know, again, if you've been around the web for a long time, like, there, the web's had problems over the years, you know, the, the prototype example being the, the, the one that I think eventually, it used to, at least in the old days, used to bite everyone in the tail at some point or another. Uh, because you'd go, I have no idea what just happened. Where did my methods go? And you're like, oh, look at this thing over here that's completely messing with my entire you know, tree. Uh, the the notion of hands off isolated sandboxed these are good concepts that from a web developer standpoint will generally make your life easier and ideally much more fruitful in the sort of features that you want to develop and the shortest ship to your end users yeah mm-hmm. or at least that's my hope yeah absolutely that's our hope as well we're just chucking away trying to make the web platform better a noble task <laughs> amongst <laughs> <laughs> a sometimes sea of no, which I don't understand. Is that the new meme, by the way? Giant no. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is. I saw that yesterday. Uh, the internet, where we ship features, but also awesome memes. Danny, Leon, we're running up against time here. We come to the end. What questions have we forgotten to ask that were on the list of lists? Am I going to be able to play Call of Duty in my browser now? Yes. Tomorrow we're launching Call of Duty. Damn it. They, they keep telling me not to say things like that. But um, uh, So absolutely, we, we do hope in general that more of these native uh, use cases for uh, experiences will start to move to the web. And I think one of the exciting things that we saw in just the last couple of months is very large and popular engines such as Unity and Unreal have actually now shipped a uh, web export target. Uh, the Unity one is called WebGL. Um, and these this means that you can take all of these games that were created in Unity and Unreal and you can actually just export them to the web. You don't have to recreate them from scratch. You gain access to all of these um, uh, amazing experiences that were created in these engines and they can just be, boom, done, ported to the web. Uh, and that's really exciting. Don't worry, Danny. As soon as we finish here, I'm working on the uh, Call of Duty web component. Drag and drop. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Can't and, wait. And actually, you know, since we have a, just a few minutes left, I do want to briefly describe some of the advantages that I'm really excited about with bringing some of these experiences to the web. And, and the natural question that a lot of people will ask is, well, why, why should I bother actually exporting to the web? If I already have a native application, what, what's the point? Um, and I think... Having been on the web for a while now and you know used the web a lot, there are just a lot of advantages that the web provides specifically for applications. And having the experience of clicking a link and then immediately jumping into an application is such a like amazing feeling to suddenly just be editing. I don't have to worry about installing something. I don't have to think, do I actually trust this application to have full unmitigated access to all of my files and an operating system? Um, I can just be in the experience and, and loading something up. We actually just recently learned that uh, SketchUp, which is a, a 3D modeling application, uh, they now have shipped a version uh, of their application on the web through WebAssembly. And it was this hilarious experience where you go to their page and you actually like go to their install page, quote unquote, and then suddenly you're actually just in the application. Boom, done. Uh, and you can start playing around. Uh, and that's a really great feeling and, and one that I'm really excited for more native experiences to take advantage of, including games. This feeling that I don't have to worry about downloading Call of Duty and uh, connecting with all of my friends. I just start the game, copy a link, send it to my friends over a chat, and boom, they're jumping into the action with me. Just when you thought the web platform couldn't get in any more places, something like WebAssembly <laughs> comes along. <laughs> we, just, we keep growing. We keep spreading. That's, that's, that's our goal. 
And yeah, I have to say, it's so cool when people just like drop in WebAssembly. They don't talk to us at all. They just do it. And then they ship it. And we're like, oh, wow. Hey, that worked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. These, these aren't people that we were like, you have to use WebAssembly. We, we weren't pushing this. We just suddenly find out like, oh, my God, somebody created something amazing using WebAssembly. It's, it's always really exciting to see. <laughs> it is that uh, that response of it works. It works. I mean, of course, of course, it works. Of course, yeah, of course, it works. We we, we knew it was going to all along. The low fr- the low friction web. You know, the, that's that's the key. I think, right? I mean, the web offers such a low friction point to to start. Yeah, um, where you don't necessarily need that vendor outreach, right? Like all of a sudden, something shipped up with WebAssembly, going, okay, good. The docs are the docs are working. And, <laughs> All of a sudden, users are going, wow, I can just still copy this link and magically I'm there. Yeah. Right. As opposed to going through and downloading, like I said, you know, some massive binary that, you know, requires an app store account that requires a credit card, even though the thing's free. Again, the web just takes away so much of that, uh, you know, additional cruft that uh, users sometimes don't want to go through. Yeah, you're exactly uh, and right. And, and the last note that I'll add there on the kind of low friction web and some of the advantages that that brings is also the universal aspect of the web, right? Like the web is the only truly universal platform in the sense that it works on Macs, it works on Windows, it works on Linux, it works on Android, it works on iOS. I mean, I, I, there are refrigerators and treadmills that run the web, right? It's, it's truly everywhere. And, and when you create experiences for the web, you don't have to keep recreating it for different platforms. Sounds really great. The idea of obviously just being able to go straight to into an application without having to install it. Um, but assuming you know the the core code of the application has got to get the, to their device, their browser somehow. So how does assuming it has to download those binaries, right? So are they large? Obviously, that depends on how big the application is. But how how does that get managed? Obviously, we're so hell bent on making sure that we don't you know, send more than a kilobyte of JavaScript to the browser. So how does how does uh, WebAssembly fit in with that kind of mindset? I don't think that WebAssembly fundamentally changes all of these problems. It definitely makes it easier in the sense that WebAssembly is much smaller than what the equivalent JavaScript code would be. So you're able to send more WebAssembly than you would be able to send JavaScript. But some of these applications do have to be architectured a little bit with the web in mind, specifically on how they load. Uh, and we've seen a lot of applications do this very, very well. Uh, and it's the experience of you kind of get the primary little UI down, and then as you actually need functionality, you'll just pull those down over time uh, in kind of a streaming application architecture. And this works quite well for games. Uh, we've seen where you'll pull down kind of the basic start menu very easily. You're able to jump into the action. Uh, and then you load like the first level, and then each time you transition, you just load that piece by piece. Uh, and it can be a very, very smooth experience. I think there's a natural pushback from users as well, right? Like with the app ecosystem, people are so used to waiting. Like I remember writing the BART and watching somebody load up a game on their phone and then wait for like a minute for the game to start. And people just don't put up with that stuff on the web. People bounce from websites in 10 seconds, right? And so what we'll see is that people will try and ship large, slow binaries to the web and and users won't put up with it and then they'll slim them down. And I think... Um, yeah, WebAssembly makes that easier because it is going to be a little bit smaller than the equivalent JavaScript, as Thomas said. Yeah, and also just the fact that cool. a lot of times users, developers specifically, are more cognizant of that on the web, this notion that if you create a slow lo- slow loading experience, people will abandon you. And I think that's a story that we've been telling on the web for a very long time. And so it's kind of embedded. Uh, whereas on other platforms, like Ben said, on, on uh, mobile, a lot of times, you know, they just will abandon it as well. But developers won't necessarily know or think about it as much. Cool. Um, so since we are kind of running up against time, um, if somebody wants to start, you know, learning more about WebAssembly, start to, you know, want to have a play around with it, um, and what's what's the place to go to? Uh, any recommendations? And, and we'll make sure that the, the resources get put in the show notes. Yeah, I, I think a great getting started point is uh, the MDN documentation. Uh, they have some nice little getting started guides uh, that, that'll kind of get you going with the basic setup. If you are interested in going deeper, there are some interesting code labs, which we'll link to that'll let you kind of play around with what it's like to actually port things uh, and such. And then lastly, if you're really interested in kind of how WebAssembly works at a guts level, there are some really great articles by Lynn Clark at Mozilla, where she's kind of written up very uh, comprehensible explainers on how WebAssembly works and why it has the properties that it does. 
And if you want to go even deeper, please, please join the WebAssembly community group. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I will be your friend. Fantastic. Go, go get new friends, people. Come be part of the process because the more people that are part of the process, the better things generally get. Feedback is good. And with that, uh, we'd like to thank you, Thomas and Ben, for coming on the show today. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. Thank you for having us. Uh, when uh, well, you guys will have to come back and tell us more about uh, WebAssembly as features roll out and things. It's it's a it's it's an amazing addition to the platform. It really is, and I, I know that myself personally, and I know Dan Leon and Amal, who's not here. Amal was in chat screaming questions at us uh, because uh, well, not screaming, just <laughs> mostly because she likes to point to things and say, hey, ask these questions because I can't be there. Uh, but everyone's really excited about it. We just want to thank you you all for working on it. Danny, Leon, any f closing thoughts before we round out this episode? Uh, my only parting thought is uh, bringing up something that we said at the beginning, and that is the fact that this is already supported in all the major browsers. So it is something that you can start playing around with and something you can potentially look at as a solution for a problem you have. I think that's a perfect note to end on. I think there's a long time been a lot of excitement about WebAssembly and its future. And the thing that I am now excited about is actually seeing people use it because it is completely ready for prime time. It's completely ready for you to go and build your solutions on the web with WebAssembly. And I'm so excited to see that happen more and more. Start building, folks. You heard them. It's there. It's time to use it. And with that, this has been number 162 of the web platform podcast tune in next week when we talk more things web more things platform more things amazing to develop with thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your week